Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give it a couple minutes to get everyone in the room here. Good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room here. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. My name is Brett Spital, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. On today's webinar, we will be discussing antiviral gene therapy for Artemis deficient severe combined immunodeficiency. And um, please make sure to, uh, to feel free to uh, ask any questions um, by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we'll pre um, present to our speaker after the presentation. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, May 5th. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Cowan from the Allergy, Immunology, and Blood and Marrow Transplant Division at UCSF Department of Pediatrics. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Cowan, and I'll now turn it over to you to get us started, sir. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Brett, and thanks for inviting me to speak to your group about um, our clinical trial. Um, I know that there's an interest um, that you have in lentiviral gene therapy for hemophilia. So I hope what I tell you today uh, will help you with, um, with uh, what you're doing. Um, I know that uh, Mark Walters presented to you a while ago about uh, gene therapy for sickle cell disease. And in some respects, this is, the, you know, this is one um, end of the spectrum that I'm gonna talk about, the other end of the spectrum, as you'll, you'll see as we go on. So these are my financial disclosures. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest. And this, this figure um, I'm beginning with because it's um, key to understanding the rationale for bone marrow transplantation in general, in which the goal is to restore normal hematopoiesis by engrafting hematopoietic stem cells um, into a patient's uh, bone marrow. And the stem cell here is represented by this uh, CD34 positive cell, and CD34 uh, is expressed not only on stem cells, but uh, progenitor cells. And about 10% of um, this population of cells actually represents the stem cell, which is capable of um, uh, repopulating itself, as well as differentiating into all the different lineages that are found in uh, the blood. What uh, we're going to focus on today are uh, these cells here, the T, B, T and B cells and natural killer cells, um, which are all lymphocytes and which uh, represent um, the, uh, the part of the immune system that is called, at least the T and B cells represent the adaptive immune system, and then the natural killer cells are part of the innate immune system. So what is severe combined immunodeficiency disease? Well, it's the most severe form of primary immune deficiency, um, and it's reflected by virtually absent T cells, um, absent B cells, or if there are B cells present, they don't function, and then the presence or absence of natural killer cells. It can be inherited um, as an X-linked form, which is the most uh, common uh, genotype or most common form of SCID. But also there's uh, many autosomal recessive forms and maybe it's 25 to 30% are uh, spontaneous um, in development. Uh, these patients classically, this is prior to newborn screening, present 
with symptoms generally uh, prior to six months of age. And this can be infection, failure to thrive, skin rashes, thrush, which you can see uh, in this picture, uh, draining otitis media, chronic diarrhea, cough, then a variety of opportunistic infections, including pneumocystis, cytomegalovirus, RSV, and so forth. Um, now that we have newborn screening in the US, we now know that the incidence of SCID is actually uh, more common than we had thought, although it's still a rare disease, about one per 60,000 live births. Um, with newborn screening, we now see patients looking like this. That is, they look perfectly healthy, at least on the outside. Um, and we also know that these patients um, without, if they don't get uh, a bone marrow transplant, hematopoietic cell transplant, or they don't get, um, in the case of adenosine deaminase deficiency, uh, enzyme replacement therapy, or now more recently gene therapy, that they will die within, generally within the first year of life. So it's a pretty, um, it's a very severe di disease. So we also know that um, there are about 20 genes, mutations in which result in severe combined immunodeficiency disease. And there are four different immunophenotypes based upon the presence or absence of T cells, B cells, or natural killer cells. And I've just broken them down um, in terms of their uh, metabolic pathways, but what we're gonna talk about today is just gene therapy. And there are four, um, four genes in which there have been clinical trials or ongoing clinical trials of gene therapy. I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them. I'm just gonna focus on uh, this last one for Artemis but adenosine deaminase deficiency has the T minus, B minus, NK minus phenotype. Uh, IL2RG is the X-linked form, which is the most common uh, genotype, and that is T minus, B plus, NK minus. And then there are the defects that uh, result in uh, abnormal T and B cell uh, receptor generation, and they have the T minus, B minus phenotype. Um, and in addition to uh, RAG1 being one of the genes that is, uh, for which there's now a uh, trial, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the uh, Artemis or DCLRE1C mutations. So uh, DCLRE1C or DNA cross-link repair 1C gene encodes for the protein uh, Artemis. And Artemis, uh, we know, is essential for double-stranded break DNA repair, which um, occurs during BDJ recombination. And BDJ recombination is uh, responsible for the generation of the T cell and B cell uh, receptor diversity that makes up our adaptive immune system. And the process that um, is responsible for BDJ recombination is non-homologous end joining. And that's shown in this uh, somewhat busy figure. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through it other than to point out that um, there are multiple uh, arrays of, uh, of DNA sequences, coding sequences that are on several different chromosomes. And the recombinase activating gene or RAG gene complex uh, randomly cuts these coding sequences um, and uh, the process of BDJ recombination or non-homologous end joining brings these uh, sequences together um, to form this coding joint, which then expresses the either T cell or B cell receptor. And this is the process of BDJ recombination or non-homologous end joining rather that brings them together. And you can see that there are multiple proteins that are involved in this. And Artemis actually plays a very critical role. So if Artemis is missing, then this process uh, doesn't occur. The other thing that I'll just uh, point out as an aside is that the, is that the uh, DNA that is cut 
and is uh, generally is no longer needed is also brought together. These blunt ends are brought together um, to form a small circular DNA or the, uh, with a signal joint. And um, these, this can be, these can be measured in the cell uh, by a piece, simple PCR reaction. And these are the TREX or T cell receptor excision circles that we measure now routinely as part of newborn screening for SCID. So it turns out that most radiation and uh, alkylator induced double-stranded breaks in DNA are repaired by non-homologous end joint. So if Artemis is not present, then not only are there no T and B cells that develop giving you this T minus B minus phenotype, but um, you also can't repair DNA double-stranded breaks normally. And this results in an increased susceptibility to alkylating chemotherapy and ionizing radiation. So what about Artemis deficient skid or art skid? So it's fairly rare um, compared to other genotypes of skid. It represents about 3% of skid in the US and Canada. So we see maybe two to three patients per year. So it's a pretty rare disease. Um, but there, are, there is an increased incidence in certain populations. So in the US, it's uh, the Athabascan speakers, that is the Navajo and Apache Native Americans live in the Southwestern US. And we've uh, shown that the incidence there is actually one per 2000 uh, live births. And then there's also increased incidence in the Middle East. It turns out that Artemis deficient skid is the most difficult form of skid to treat with an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. That is a standard transplant from a healthy donor. So even with an HLA matched sibling donor, which is the gold standard for bone marrow transplantation, um, without any conditioning, if you give no chemotherapy ahead of time, you will get some T cell engraftment. Um, but the T cell immunity is often incomplete. And in less than 10% of patients will there be B cell immunity restored. And this is quite different compared to other genotypes where you can uh, essentially cure these patients by giving them a matched sibling bone marrow transplant without any conditioning. Uh, unfortunately, less than 20% of these babies are going to have a matched sibling. So we have to rely on alternative donors, such as unrelated volunteer donors or cord blood as a source of um, stem cells or half-matched parents um, or other relatives as donors. But when you use these alternative donors, there's increased rejection and there's very poor T and B cell immunity constitution. And there's also an increase in um, what we call graft versus host disease, which is a reaction when donor T cells recognize histocompatibility differences in the recipient and basically attack various uh, tissues and organs in the recipient. Um, you can overcome these problems of increased rejection and poor immune reconstitution by uh, giving high-dose alkylator chemotherapy as the conditioning regimen. This is um, in part what was, has been done for um, uh, treating patients with sickle cell disease, for example, that uh, Dr. Uh, Walters had talked about. However, because of the increased sensitivity to these agents, these patients will develop short stature. Um, they often won't develop permanent teeth um, they develop endocrinopathies and they have increased mortality over time. So it's for these reasons that uh, using, doing autologous gene therapy, where there's no rejection, no graft versus host disease, we thought this might offer a better approach for this patient population. So this is um, a, a single data slide from the Primary Immune uh, Deficiency Treatment Consortium, which is part of the uh, Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. It's NIH funded, and it represents about 50 centers in the US and, and Canada with a focus on 
primary immune deficiencies, and one of them is SCID. And in a, a very large study that we uh, did a few years, published a few years ago, we looked at over 600 patients with SCID that had been diagnosed over the last 30 years and in North America and have been treated with a bone marrow transplant. And this is just looking at um, the impact or the effect of genotype on survival when alternative donors were used, that is when an HLA matched sibling donor was not available. And you can see here that, and these are the most common um, uh, genotypes that uh, we evaluated, and you can see that the patients with Artemis deficient SCID had a significantly poor uh, survival um, over 10 year period of time. In another study that uh, we did at UCSF in collaboration with uh, 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 groups at, in Paris and in Ulm, uh, Germany, we pulled together um, 69 patients with ART skid and then 76 patients with RAG deficient skid. Now, the, the main difference between RAG skid and ART skid because they, they both have the same phenotype. They both have T minus, B minus skid, but it's only the Artemis deficient patients that have the radiation and alkylator sensitivity. So the RAG patients uh, do not have that, and they behave more like other uh, genotypes that don't have this radiation or alkylator agent sensitivity. And what we found when we looked at clinical complications that occurred uh, in patients who survived beyond two years uh, post a bone marrow transplant was that in every category that we looked at, the Artemis deficient patients um, fared much, more poor, much worse compared to the RAG patients. So this was the overall 70% versus 24%. But when we broke it down into chronic GVHD, autoimmunity, uh, severe recurrent infections, a short stature, uh, dental abnormalities, and late deaths. In every case, um, the Artemis patients uh, did significantly worse. And in multivariate analysis, it was exposure to any alkylator therapy that was um, uh, significantly associated with uh, these differences. So what about the clinical trials? So I'm gonna focus on that for the rest of the talk. Um, and this is a phase one, two feasibility study of uh, gene transfer uh, for art skid And we're using a self-inactivating lentiviral vector that we have named APRO-ART and transducing autologous CD34 hematopoietic cells. So the investigational product is the APRO-ART-CD34. This is just a picture of the uh, vector a lentiviral vector that we're using. So this is a self-inactivating vector. And what, what that means is that um, in the long terminal repeats, which are on either side here of the vector, uh, there's a portion in this U3 region that contains a very um, uh, potent enhancer and promoter activity. And it was this region that was felt to be responsible for insertional mutagenesis, leukemias that developed in skid patients um, over 20 years ago when um, a different type of vector, it wasn't a lentiviral, it was a, um, a gamma retroviral vector uh, was used. That was the first generation of, of vectors. Um, but over after studying this and realizing that it was probably the um, this region, uh, this was deleted. And so after um, one round of uh, transcription and reverse transcription, uh, this deletion is is also found in the other LTR at the other LTR, the five prime n, and the uh, vector essentially is uh, inactivated. So this vector here for Artemis contains the human Artemis or DCLRE1C cDNA, and it's driven by its own promoter, APRO. And the reason that we decided to use the natural human 
Artemis promoter is that we and others showed years ago that too much Artemis uh, production in a cell is toxic to the cell. So we decided to uh, use the uh, Artemis promoter um, to better regulate uh, the amount of Artemis that, that, uh, that is produced. So we are using conditioning because it's been shown that in order to uh, achieve both T and B cell immune reconstitution, um, you need to give some alkylating therapy in the form of busulfan, um, but we're using a non myeloablative um, amount of busulfan and we're targeting it uh, using pharmacokinetics to a cumulative area under the curve of about 20. And just to give you a frame of reference, the standard amount of busulfan that's given like for sickle cell disease um, uh, or for other uh, bone marrow transplants, other diseases, you know, the ablative amount is 80. So we're giving about a quarter of the amount, hoping that that will be less toxic to these patients. And then they're getting an infusion of bone marrow derived um, transduced cells. So we're looking at safety, survival, and primarily T cell reconstitution, but we're also interested uh, to see to what extent we can achieve B cell reconstitution. So this is a, a nice uh, picture that uh, the New England Journal kindly uh, produced uh, for us um, that shows the process of gene therapy for our skid. So uh, Again, bone marrow cells are collected in the operating room and then taken to the GMP facility at UCSF where the CD34 uh, stem cells are isolated and then they're cultured overnight. And after that, um, the vector, so this is a simplification of the vector that we've already talked about that contains the uh, cDNA for DCLRU1C and the endogenous um, uh, Artemis promoter uh, packaged in the lentivirus. Um, so these cells are then cultured with this uh, lentiviral vector for two days, after which the uh, cells are cryopreserved in liquid nitrogen um, after we've taken very small samples for um, uh, release to meet release criteria. So looking for any contamination uh, looking for the efficiency of the transduction and, and so forth. So that takes about seven days to achieve. And once that's done, then uh, the patient receives two daily doses of busulfan, uh, targeted busulfan. And the cells are then on the, on the third day uh, thawed and infused back into the patient. So the stem cells go to the bone marrow where they will uh, mature into B cells and uh, early pre T cells. And those cells then go to the thymus where they mature into uh, different uh, T cell subpopulations. So the trial started in May of 2018. We've treated 12 patients so far. Third of them have been uh, Navajo or Apache descent, and then the eight others have had a variety of uh, backgrounds. The median age at the time of treatment was 2.9 months. Um, they all got bone marrow CD34 cells. Uh, the uh, uh, conditioning, uh, we've already talked about the targeted busulfan, and the median CAUC for busulfan that we achieved was 19. So we were with a very narrow uh, range here. So the targeting works and, and um, we weren't giving too much and we weren't giving too little. The median CD34 cell dose was 7.7 .7 million CD34 per kilo. Uh, the vector copy number in the graph was 2.5 copies per cell. And the median transduction efficiency was 78%. And we saw no toxicity related to either busulfan or the cell infusion in the first uh, 42 days um, of, after treatment. 
So this just shows the, uh, some of the cell lineages um, in the blood during the first 42 days. You can see that uh, with this dose of busulfan, there was no uh, major drop in uh, hemoglobin level. Uh, none of these patients required any transfusions. Uh, the platelets did drop, but again, they never dropped to a level that uh, required transfusion uh, therapy and they uh, recovered counts by uh, 42 days. And then this is the ANC, which bounced around quite a bit. Um, but uh, again, um, only a few patients got to a level where they needed some help in stimulating their uh, neutrophil counts. And then this is T and B cell numbers reconstitution. Uh, you can see that the T cells are restored to normal, generally uh, between six and uh, 12 months post-treatment. And um, this occurs in virtually all the patients. These are the subsets, CD4, uh, CD8 cells, uh, naive T cells, and uh, T regulatory cells. There was uh, one patient here you can see who um, uh, had poor T cell reconstitution because it was a, he presented with a very severe cytomegalovirus infection and required high doses of again cyclovir and other antiviral therapy. And his CMV initially responded as his T cell immunity uh, came up, but then it recurred. So at 12 months, we gave him a second. Uh, treatment and um, his T cell immunity now is entirely normal and he's at home doing quite well. This is the B cell. So you can see the B cell numbers recover a little bit more heterogeneously. There's a population of the majority of the patients develop B cells that um, become normal, whereas there are, uh, there's a small number of patients that uh, develop B cells but they've remained relatively low. And then this just is a functional test for uh, T cells. It's a proliferative response to phytohemagglutinin or PHA. And uh, we look at, you can look at CD45 cells as well as uh, specifically CD3 cells. And uh, T cell function is restored in almost all the patients by, uh, six, uh, by six months uh, post-treatment. This is the one patient that uh, needed a, a repeat um, treatment. And this is the gene marking in the, in the multi-lineages, T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, myeloid cells, and uh, granulocytes. And again, you can see that there's excellent marking in uh, T cells and B cells in these patients. Um, again, the, the y-axis is different um, in the T and B cells versus the uh, other three populations. And the reason is that we're not ablating the NK cells or the myeloid cells or granulocytes. Uh, basically, we're uh, giving enough in order to get sufficient uh, stem cell engraftment, probably in the order of 10% or so. Um, in order to generate T cells and B cells. So the percent of, um, of marked uh, or transduced uh, NK cells, myeloid cells, and granulocytes is going to be uh, lower. And this probably, especially for the myeloid and the granulocytes, probably reflects um, the stem cell uh, transduction, the uh, stem cell marking. And it suggests that uh, all we need is about 10% um, engraftment in order to restore um, the innate immune system. So this is um, insertion site analysis. So we looked at, we've looked at uh, in the various uh, cell uh, subsets, populations, uh, the insertion sites and what you see in the colored bars represent the um, most com the top 10 uh, insertion sites. And you can see the, the important point to see is that there, is, there isn't any insertion site 
that uh, reflects uh, more than 10% of, that makes up more than 10% of all of the cell populations. So uh, basically there's no, we've seen no evidence of clonal amplification. Um, and then this, uh, these Venn diagrams, again, are looking at subsets and looking at common insertion sites. And the point here is that this demonstrates that in fact, we are getting uh, uh, transduction of the hematopoietic stem cell. So in terms of uh, immune reconstitution in the 10 patients who are now out um, at least two years with a median follow-up of 40 months, uh, T-cell immune reconstitution in uh, tw at 24 months uh, has been very good, uh, seven of nine. There was the one censored patient that I mentioned before because of cytomegalovirus and requiring a second infusion. And so it's uh, practically speaking, it's eight of 10. In terms of B-cell immunity, um, all, all 10 of the patients have B cells. We've been able to stop uh, immunoglobulin infusions to support them in four of the patients. Um, they're all immunized, um, responding to both live and, and uh, killed and live uh, vaccines. And there are two more that are due to stop this summer. The one challenge that we've had is that we do see autoimmunity post the gene therapy. And I, the, it's primarily autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And I need to point out that this is something that we see in allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, um, probably in 10 to 20%, especially with alternative donors. And it's also been described in other uh, trials of autologous um, gene therapy for XSKID and ADA skid uh, in addition to allo transplant. So autoimmunity is a problem, but we're seeing it maybe more in the art skid patients than uh, with a higher frequency than it's been seen elsewhere in five of the 10 evaluable patients who have had it uh, began in the first uh, year post-gene therapy and seems to resolve as the immune system fully recovers. Two of the patients, uh, we saw it with cytomegalovirus in association with cytomegalovirus infection. And that's something that's been reported uh, by others. Um, and one of these patients, actually, we just picked it up by um, screening. Uh, that patient actually never required any treatment and only one of the five patients required a transfusion and it's resolved in all of the patients. And then we've had one patient with probable and one patient with possible autoimmune hypothyroidism. Both of them um, also had autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, all the patients are at home uh, doing well and living normal lives. So to date, uh, it appears that infusion of gene-inserted autologous CD34 cells appears safe for patients with uh, newly diagnosed Artemis-deficient SCID. We see no rejection, obviously no GVHD. Uh, we will need longer follow-up of these patients to see how durable this is, but it does appear uh, to be quite durable. Uh, the low exposure uh, targeted busulfan appears to be well tolerated, and we're getting multi lineage engraftment um, with the development of T and B cells. And it looks like um, you can get away with less than 10% gene corrected um, stem cells for immune reconstitution. We're seeing a significant diversity of the insertion sites, no dominant clones so far. Um, there is the risk of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And uh, I would say to date, the outcomes with gene therapy are, are quite good um, and superior to what we've seen with allogeneic transplant with respect to overall survival, event-free survival, immune reconstitution, and uh, we're minimizing toxicity. So a lot of people to acknowledge, I'm not gonna go uh, through the names, but you know, it involves referring doctors, it, uh, many people at UCSF, including my uh, co-PI, Jennifer Puck, uh, 
um, and uh, patients and families, and then uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which has funded all of the research that we've done in developing this uh, vector and, and implementing this clinical trial. So it really does take a village uh, to accomplish this. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Cowan. We appreciate it. Um, we do have several questions that, that have come in, and uh, Dr. Valentino is joining us as well, too. But I will start with the first one. It says, in your first slide, you spoke about the blood-forming cells that need to be restored following bone marrow transplantation. In a person with hemophilia, are the same cells needed to be restored? Well, <laughs> Yeah, if you're, uh, yeah, I would say if, if the goal is to use um, lentiviral gene therapy um, and the source of the cells are going to be the hematopoietic stem cell, then yes, you would expect, you know, you may not need it in lymphocytes, but you're probably going to need it in myeloid cells. And of course, if you get it into the hematopoietic stem cell, then it is likely to be in all cells. Uh, people have used different uh, uh, methods or approaches for trying to um, emphasize or enhance the uh, expression of a particular protein, like say for hemophilia um, in a cell population, like in myeloid cells. Uh, by using uh, myeloid promoters and, and so forth. But, uh, but yeah, if this was going to be used for hemophilia, then you would you'd want to get it into all of those cell populations. Great, great. Um, another question that, had, that, that came in, um, what safety measures are in place for clinical trials with infants that differ from clinical trials for adults? Hmm. I don't, I, I think they're clinical, I mean, I think they're relatively similar, you know, for, for our patient population, for these babies, of course, the concern is exposing um, the, you know, children, these babies to any, any whether it's uh, Artemis or, or X-Skid or, you know, some other type of skid, um, exposing them to an alkylating agent uh, we know that high dose alkylating agents can have uh, late effects, toxic effects on uh, patients as they as they grow up. So, um, you know, trying to use as low an exposure as possible is certainly one of the things that that we've done. And you know, we we made it fairly. Um, Height in terms of patients having to have normal evidence of liver function and kidney function and so forth. On the other hand, you, you have to balance the those you know potential risks with what you're treating. And of course, in our case, with ArtSkid, we had no the, the, the alternative is an allogeneic bone marrow transplant for which there isn't any. Uh, you know, for which the data, you know, we can we can cure these patients, but at a cost, and um, and and at a risk, and and the survival just isn't as good as we would like. So, you know, everything is going to be balanced in terms of the risk versus the benefits, and so it really depends on the specific disease that that you're treating. But you know, the risk of insertional mutagenesis, that is, you know inserting into a gene that uh, may cause cancer in the future is going to be a risk for adults or for um, or for the you know for children so I'm not sure there's a whole lot of difference in, in what what you do the other thing I want to mention about the first question is that, that the advantage of getting the vector, you know, transducing a stem cell, a hematopoietic stem cell, is that the effect is should be lifelong. Um, and, and we have patients um, from other trials, like for XKID, that are out now more than 20 years, in which 
they're continuing to have normal uh, T cell immunity. So, you know, it's that lifelong correction. If you uh, target a subset, a committed progenitor cell population, like just the myeloid cells um, with your vector, then that's, those cells aren't gonna last nearly as long and the effect is not gonna be as long. Great. Hope that Great. makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Cowan. Um, another question that has come in through the Q&A, are you worried about ISA in these patients given the past history from Dr. Gluckman's group? I'm sorry, ISA. Oh, insertional, are you talking about insertional mutagenesis? I believe so. Yeah, well, that's, we talked about that. That's, so the experience with these self-inactivating lentiviral vectors, and there's probably 10 years, eight to 10 years of experience now in a variety of diseases. It's, you know, not just sickle cell disease, thalassemia, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, other um, immune deficiencies and, and some of the metabolic diseases is that um, the risk of this insertional mutagenesis of developing a, a leukemia is much, much lower than it was before, you know, using the, the gamma retroviral vector that was not self inactivated. So in that initial trial from Paris, the uh, risk was the, the incidence, if you combined um, the Paris experience and the experience at Great Ormond Street where they used the same gamma retroviral vector construct, they treated the patients the same way, there was no conditioning, no busulfan was given. Um, of the 20 patients who were reconstituted, uh, six of them developed leukemia. So, you know, there you're talking about a 30% incidence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, right now we think that it's going to be much, much lower. All the studies that have been done to test uh, the lentiviral vectors out suggest that it is much lower, probably less than 1%. Um, but that means that you you know, can imagine how many um, patients you're going to have to treat you're going to have to follow them for quite a while before you'll know exactly, um, you know, how, how low that, that risk is. Uh, the, in, there's been at least one ADA skid patient and one of the ex-skid patients who developed cancer, leukemia, um, 16 years post-infusion. So, you know, we're always going to be worried and we're all going to have to follow these patients for quite a long time before we are going to feel um, fully confident that, you know, they're not at risk. Great. Great. Thanks, Dr. Collin. Next question that comes in. Um, do you believe that newborn screening should be considered for hemophilia or other rare inherited bleeding disorders? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> The hard part is convincing the powers that be in the federal government and in the states, um, you know, that that uh, that it should be, um, you know, that there should be screening. And it's been very hard in in Europe, even with the the, the data that we've generated in the U.S. Um, to convince governments to approve newborn screening because of cost and and so forth. But, um, you know, there's, there's a whole list, this is kind of another talk, but there's a whole list of requirements that need to be met in terms of, um, you know, newborn screening before, you know, they, it would be approved um, in terms of the, the, you know, the risk to the patient um, of having the disease, the, uh, and also the ability to diagnose it quickly and, and cheaply because, you know, we can, we measure these treks in the Guthrie cards, the blood spots. And if there's an assay that you can uh, measure and detect hemophilia that way, then that, you know, that's certainly a step in the right direction. But I'm probably not the person to be talking 
to you about uh, you know, newborn screening for hemophilia. Great, no, appreciate appreciate that, appreciate the answer. Um, next question that came in is, I've heard that uh, busulfane is very toxic. Are there alternatives? That's a great question. Um, the, the answer is yes and yes, or yes and sort of. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's an alkylating agent in, in high doses. Um, it can affect a lot of things in terms of potentially growth and in, in terms of uh, uh, sterility, uh, reproduction. Um, although I can tell you in studies, uh, large studies that have been done now in patients with, mostly with cancer, primarily with cancer who have gotten bone marrow transplants and have been followed for decades that the biggest risk to them is not the busulfan, it's radiation. Mm. So, but it's still, it's a drug that if I didn't have to use, I wouldn't. Um, it's probably the best one right now for, you know, the purpose that we're, for which we're, we're using it. Now, obviously because of the patient population that I'm dealing with that have this, has increased sensitivity, um, even more motivated to try to get rid of the busulfan. And there have been some, there's, there are people working on um, primarily a, a monoclonal antibodies that uh, target the stem cell and that can either in and of themselves uh, neutralize or, or, or deplete the stem cell, uh, the CD34 stem cell, positive stem cell, or um, uh, if they're, or, or along with a, uh, an, a, an immunotoxin, a toxin attached to the, uh, the monoclonal antibody can kill uh, either a toxin or a, a, a radioactive molecule, an alpha emitter um, can kill the, the stem cell. And there's lots of studies in animal models, um, mice and uh, dogs and uh, I think, and in monkeys that look promising uh, that they're going to work, but when they've been then tested in clinical trials, they haven't, they, they've worked a little bit, but they haven't worked as well as we would like. And so I think there's just gonna need to be more work done and, and there is, and I, I would say, I would think that within the next five years, uh, at least for gene therapy and, and, and maybe other diseases as well, uh, we'll be, we won't be or won't need to be using uh, these alkylating agents. Great, great. Thanks, Dr. Cowan. One last question that came in. Um, have these autoimmune problems been seen in other lentivirus gene therapy programs, or is this unique to the underlying disease? Yeah, it's, to my knowledge, it's been seen in other lentiviral therapies for SCID, okay, for X-SCID, for adenosine deaminase SCID. Um, I think it'll also be seen in RAG SCID. Um, there just haven't, there've only been two patients treated and there haven't been followed long enough to know, but um, we've seen it there. We haven't, I'm not aware of it having been seen in other um, trials for other diseases. Great. Great. Um, Dr. Valentino, I'll ask if you wanted to chime in on anything before we uh, close out. Yeah, but yeah, first I'd like to thank Dr. Cohen for a great presentation, really informative. Um, I'd like to go back to the question around newborn screening. So just to let the audience know that we are working with um, uh, Dr. Stephen Kingsmore at Rady Children's Hospital and the Rady Genomics Institute on newborn screening uh, using whole genome sequencing techniques to be able to sequence for uh, rare uh, treatable conditions, including a number of uh, inherited uh, congenital bleeding disorders, including hemophilia A and B, uh, as well as things like factor 13 deficiency, fibrinogen deficiency, prothrombin deficiency, on and on and on. Uh, so we're really looking to, uh, to be able to uh, get newborn screening more uh, mainstream uh, into the bleeding disorders community. So more to come on that uh, as we can develop more work with them. 
uh, and uh, have some results to be able to share uh, as this program, uh, which is called Begin NGS, uh, comes to fruition. So I just wanted to add that as a, as a note. And again, thank Dr. Cowan for a wonderful presentation. Yeah, thanks, Len. Appreciate that. And um, Dr. Cowan, we thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We appreciate your time and expertise. And um, I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for joining us. Um, please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, May 5th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our other archive webinars. Dr. Cowan, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it and um, taking the time out of your busy schedule, sir. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Take care, all.